It's really great to be <clears throat> with you all. Um, now more than ever, it's really important to feel like we belong. Um, and Yale is a community that we belong to. So it's really great to be here, not just giving the talk I normally give, but in the context of this community. And I'll say, before we talk about how we scale social impact, I think it's really important to begin by asking why. Um, we all have a different answer to that question. Um, and for me, I hold myself accountable to two women when I think about that question. The one is my grandmother, Lydia Levine, who, before I knew when I learned this, I knew that she had been a Holocaust survivor. And I think for her, and what I learned from her growing up was that really bad things happen when we stop treating each other as people. Um, and so a lot of what motivates me in the work we do is really down to something so essential as how do we create the conditions where we can each see and treat each other as people. And I think that's highly motivating in, in all the work we do. The other person I hold myself accountable is my six-year-old daughter. Um, and I used to say this in an abstraction, like, hey, I want my work to be meaningful so that I make the life of her generation better. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. It's not an abstraction anymore. She's six. So she literally asked me this morning, um, you know, I made it. I got her into the car, but I didn't have time to get her to school. So she said, why are you not taking me to school? And I said, well, I have to go to New York and give a speech. And anyone who has a six-year-old knows that then proceeds like 10 whys follow. And it's like it's a classic V6, what's it, the five whys? Um, and if you follow the why, it's like, why are you going to New York to give a talk? Why are you giving a talk to help people understand the way finance works? Why are you doing it? It's going to get back to that essential because we're trying to make the world a better place. So don't make me a liar to my daughter when I said that I was leaving her <laughs> to actually do something useful. Um, but, you know, and happy to talk about impact investing, but I think what's really important, and the main message I, I want to convey today is all these terms, impact investing, earned revenue, social enterprise, they're all just abstractions. And what's so important when it comes to money is that when you think about the work you all want to do, whether you're going to start organizations, be in organizations, be board members, be donors, at the end of the day, there's just a super form, there's a really simple formula. When you strip away, is it impact investing, is it philanthropy, is it social adventure, philanthropy, whatever it calls itself, anyone who wants to make change in the world, you, if you, have, you have to have, whether you're a for-profit, non-profit, we'd love to talk about why we shouldn't fetishize that distinction. Uh, really simple formula I want you guys to remember, and that is whatever you're going to do, whether you're on a board, running it, working there, the organization has to produce on an ongoing basis more revenue that is repeatable and reliable than it costs to deliver whatever it is you're doing, and you have to be able to mobilize resources on a periodic basis to invest in innovation and growth. That's it. That's the foundation. Everything else is laid on top of it. It should it be a loan, should it be a grant? It's all just an abstraction of that essential fact. So when people say to me, should I start a nonprofit? Should I start a for-profit? You know, what are the rules? Should we have 90 days of reserves? All these things you learn about. Um, be weary of anyone who hangs on those kinds of abstractions and just come back down to the fundamentals. So I'll just take three minutes to give you quick examples of how this works in practice. Um, so what does that mean? Repeatable and reliable revenue has to cover your ongoing costs, and you have to be able to mobilize money occasionally to invest in growth. So you guys probably don't know this, but we're on 44th Street. On 26th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue, exactly one mile from where we stand right here, is a 200-bed homeless shelter. An uh, amazing organization called the Bowery Residence Committee um, got an option about 15 years ago to take an apartment building and get a 30-year lease and renovate that building and turn it into a 200-bed homeless shelter. Now, when that organization thinks about finances and money, once that shelter is operating, they have repeatable and reliable revenue because the city of New York has made a contract and said, if you fill the, we'll pay you per bed per night. They, that revenue is reliable and repeatable, and they have done this in other places so they know what it's going to cost for them to run the shelter. They know that the repeatable and reliable revenue from government is going to more than cover the costs of what it takes to run the shelter. Now, it's a tragedy in New York City, one of the richest cities the world has ever known, that there's no risk those beds won't be filled. That's not a risk. If they can build the shelter, they'll get the revenue. But they needed $20 million to gut renovate an 11-story building to turn in a homeless shelter. That's where you need to raise the one-off episodic occasional money. And so in that case, they could have gone and said, hey, we're going to wait till our donors donate the money. We're a nonprofit. Once we can raise 20 million bucks, we'll do the renovation, and then we will run the shelter. And they raise grant money. They're very good at it. But it wasn't enough. And so in that case, they came to my organization at the time, the Nonprofit Finance Fund. We were a nonprofit loan fund whose job was to lend to other nonprofits. Um, and they said, can you give us some of this money? In this case, we gave them, I think it was a few million dollars. 
that they needed to get through that first phase of permitting where it's a highly risky process. Uh, they had to fight NIMBYism from the local city council person and other things. They needed that money, they didn't have it. In order to invest in the ability to make this work, once they got through that first phase, they then raised money from Goldman Sachs in a loan from their impact investing group, ultimately raised enough money to do the gut renovation, and now that shelter is operating and providing services with dignity to people who desperately need it. So again, I don't fetishize the loan as part of that story. What I want you to understand that story is an organization had an opportunity to create repeatable and reliable revenues, in their case from government, and they needed an infusion of money up front to innovate and grow in order to get there. And so we could tell that story a lot. Just want to counter that story with two other quick examples. One, um, I was on a board of an organization. We had a tech, a very successful tech CEO, and he said, OK, I want you all to have a target for earned revenue. So in other words, you shouldn't rely on donors. Donors are fickle. They're unreliable. We should have a percentage target for the CEO of what percent of our total revenues comes from earned revenue. And I actually shut the board meeting down and um, did a like, little presentation on repeatable and reliable revenue and so forth. Because, but again, go, go down to the motivation. What he was saying was, I want this organization to have reliable revenues to cover our costs. What he was misunderstanding was an assumption that one form of revenues is necessarily more reliable than another. And in that case, to create earned revenue, we would have had to go and start some sort of business. Now, most small businesses fail. And a lot of nonprofits go bankrupt when they start small businesses. But what he was asking for is absolutely correct. We need a more diversified, reliable source of revenue than a few fickle donors. And so what we did coming out of that conversation was to say, well, you know, where we could spend our marginal time is not on trying to start a small business that's probably going to fail. It's actually on becoming more effective at getting more diversified sets of donors. So in that organization's case, repeatable and reliable revenues comes from having more donors so that even if any one of them falls out, you know that as a portfolio, they'll succeed. Last thing I'll tell you about is an organization in the Inland Empire in California. And we sat down with them. My organization, Nonprofit Finance Fund, used to advise nonprofits. Um, and we said to them, you know, part of having a stable business model is on an ongoing basis, you have repeatable and reliable revenues that cover your costs. And you have enough money to deal with crises and opportunities for innovation. We typically think of that as your operating reserve that sits in your accounting statements. It's probably held in cash somewhere. This was a community group, and we said to them, so what's your operating reserve? And they said, what? And we said, you know, the operating reserve. And they said, what is that? And we said, it's the money you have. And we literally said this. It's the money you have so that when a tree falls on your building of your community center, you can repair the roof. And the work can continue. And they said, oh, well, if the tree falls on the building, there's a contractor in town who's told us that he will do all those kinds of repairs for free, because that's his contribution to the community. And we said, oh, that's interesting. What if you didn't get a contract and you guys couldn't do your programming? And they said, well, there's another person in town who runs the local restaurant. And they said, if we ever need to, they're always going to be able, they'll come and bring us food for the programs we have for young people in the community. And so again, I think this just goes back to the essential point. Don't fetishize money, what form it takes. Can you mobilize resources? And I use that word. I didn't say money. I said resources to stabilize the organization and invest in change. And resources can take different forms. And especially if you're dealing with community groups, the forms that resources and capital take are often invisible to the formal accounting system. So if anyone says to you, to be a well-run nonprofit, you must have 90 days of cash, tell them that you actually think you reject those kinds of rules because they put an abstraction on what's actually the essential truth you're trying to create here. Wonderful. I think that's great to show that insurance isn't necessarily commercial. It could be, it could be distributed throughout the whole community. I think that's, that's a wonderful. And there is no one single tool in your toolbox. It's really a variety of tools that you have. So even Yale has different sources of revenue, right? And I mean, earned revenue is so important. Tuition, as is philanthropy, all of the past and the future. And so let's turn to higher education a little bit. We have a, we have a, a leader, um, a former president of a, a great liberal arts college who now leads a... Uh, Marika Silvers, who, who, who leads an iconic uh, foundation synonymous with Henry Luce in the American century of, of the past century, and has also been an innovator in higher education policy, um, helping to figure out how to turn these very nimble institutions around even more quickly. So, um, so now that you've been on both sides of, of philanthropy, Mariko, how do you, how do you look at uh, sustainability and, and what you try to do with your grants as a foundation? How do you, how do you think about um, uh, making your investment sustainable and scalable, and how's that different than what you used to look at it differently from the other side? 
Well, when I was looking at it from the other side, all I was look, thinking about is how was I going to get more money in the door. So I, can, I have the opportunity now to look across uh, a little bit more broadly. I really appreciated what you said, particularly the last point. I think it's really important for uh, institutional donors. So Henry Luce Foundation is an institutional donor. Some of you might recognize the name from many buildings on the Yale campus, which were uh, funded before my time. Um, but I think the obligation of institutional, institutional philanthropy, ideally, is to bring to the table, not just for itself, but for the wide range of other donors, the kind of open-mindedness that, um, that was just described in terms of thinking about revenue. So one of the roles of institutional philanthropy is to de-risk both directly with money and conceptually for other donors. So in addition to being um, uh, the president CEO of the Henry Luce Foundation, I'm on a number of boards, uh, nonprofit organizations. I have certainly encountered the kind of your, your tech friend, right? Someone with a, coming in, particularly from business, looking for a particular kind of specific measure of viability, success, robustness, et cetera. And that narrowness uh, can be really deadly for an organization if, say, for example, that person is the chair of the board, right, or they have an enormous amount of power, or they're the big donor on the board and the rest of the board is not such a big donor or they're all that person's people, right? And so then they drive a conversation that is, as Anthony said, the wrong conversation. Um, and so I think part of the role of people in uh, institutional philanthropy is to lay out the parameters of a different conversation. Obviously, our role is also to give money away. <laughs> and I think sometimes the way in which we give the money can help to reset that conversation. You see that from individual donors too, McKinsey Scott being the best current example. Uh, you see it from uh, places like Ford and the way that they have reset a number of conversations about, uh, about philanthropy and the way that money can and should flow. So one of the things that I bring to the foundation as a mindset, uh, many people do, but I bring to the foundation as a mindset, is that actually we don't have a lot of rules. The rules that we have are largely the rules that we made for ourselves. Yes, in some cases, a foundation will have rules because the donor who left the money to the foundation said you can only give in support of chairs with a dark blue cushion on the bottom and a light blue cushion on the back, and there are donors like that. <laughs> but uh, most of the big foundations don't have that. They might have categories of giving, et cetera. So the boards of those foundations, ideally with the, in support of the presidents of those foundations and the program staff, have a lot of leeway. They may have made decisions along the way that mean they don't have leeway at the particular moment that you come to them. But those rules are rules largely that they have made themselves, other than the distribute 5%. And so the, it's a lot to ask nonprofit leaders to encourage foundation leaders to think flexibly but I do think there are some opportunities for that. If you're talking to a, a foundation program staff person who has a particular idea of how they want to do something, then the opportunity to understand their strategy and to reframe for them, not their whole strategy, but where your organization fits into it, usually program staff are somewhat open to that. Maybe it takes them a year or 18 months to come around, right? but they're somewhat open to that. So I think one of the things, and I don't know how many, how many of you have ever raised money from an individual? Okay. So some of you know, probably had the experience of going into a meeting with an individual donor, having that person say to you, you know, I really only care about this kind of chair. And you're like, well, that's really interesting, but, you know, we actually find that our, you know, our community needs multicolored chairs and they want a lot of them and they'd like them to be ergonomic, totally understand your commitment to you know, chairs with a dark blue seat, but, um, and then you're in a relationship conversation with them. Uh, uh, one of my friends always says to me, relationship before task, right? You're in a relational conversation with an individual donor and you know that because you're talking with an individual specific person and their pocketbook. You're also in a relational conversation with a foundation. You're also in a relational conversation with a corporation. And so understanding as much as you can about what they're trying to accomplish, sometimes it's not a fit, or sometimes it's not a fit at that moment, but you want to maintain the relationship, and then you come around to a place where you can converge. Um, but I think one of the big things that I learned from being on the fundraising side is actually there's not as much distinction as there is a performance of a distinction between the individual donor type of conversation and the foundation type of conversation. 
Government grants, whole different deal, right? Government grants is a, is a whole other kind of, um, uh, kind of conversation, still relationship-based, uh, but again, uh, different, structurally different. And I think a lot of people and organizations, whether it's foundations or individuals, take your tech friend, right? They put up a lot of uh, barriers, spreadsheets, right? A lot of KPIs, right? A lot of barriers in between you and their resources as a self-preservation mechanism or whatever if they're an individual, but understanding why they have those boundaries there, why they have those barriers there, and how you can navigate with them as opposed to against them is, uh, is one, of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest lessons that I learned. And I think which stories you want to tell, right? I, we all tell stories when we're raising money and calibrating those stories uh, to the foundations and also to the individuals. The last thing I'll say is, I think building on your point, most donors, whether they're foundations or individuals, they want to see a variety of revenue streams. And so if you go, and, and if you go into a donor and you have one principal revenue stream and they're a different kind of donor, you might want to say to them, like, this is how, we're actually trying to diversify our revenues. We know that this is important. And that can bring somebody in, um, in a new way. Great. Th thank you, Maria. That, that, I think that's a, kind of a fundamental lesson about relationships. You know, the, as Anthony mentioned and you mentioned, you know, there is an asset base that every organization has, and that's your relationships and how do you maintain those and how do you create new ones. And I think there'll be other panels on, on marketing and, and using different techniques for, for um, how, how to build and maintain your relationships uh, for your organization. So, so we talk about organizations a lot, but Maxim is the CEO of Civic Influencers, uh, a distinguished career in uh, advocacy and civic engagement and trying to really get our youth to be more active. And you heard about some of that from, from Tom Steyer. So your mission is, is much larger than your organization. So how do you think about financing and scaling movements that transcend the boundaries of an organization, especially in the current demography where we hear that maybe um, some of the young folks in, in this um, audience notwithstanding, that there's more skepticism about institutions and organizations and that uh, um, there's impatience with um, the institutional forms that we are so familiar with. I'm panicking right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Amir. Um, well, so I really appreciated what Anthony said and I'm always impressed with Mariko. Um, so the subject, one, one, one word that struck me was scaling. Getting to scale as one concept. Uh, scaling for impact, so a theory you have to get to scale to have impact. And then scaling impact. And I think those are quite different things. Um, because in my work, you can actually just grow and grow. Um, but that doesn't mean you have any impact at all. Um, so I've been forced recently over the last few years to really think about giving with limited resources, no matter how much we are growing, it's always limited given our agenda, which has changed in somewhat, um, to how we have the most impact. Uh, so I'll get to, the, to, the, to the, where we are right now. Our democracy is really threatened globally and nationally. And my answer, which I think many of us agree, and obviously Tom Steyer agrees, is young people. Young people being the most diverse, young people being the least homophobic, the least racist, the least um, anti-environment. Um, and so how do we get this also less resourced uh, group of people to shift, shift power to them? to get them engaged. And how do we get to that kind of scale? And a movement that keeps shifting. So I'll give you one starting point on how different it is today. Uh, I worked on the Barack Obama campaign. And then I joined the senior vice president of the NAACP nationally. And a former president of the NAACP when Barack Obama won the presidency said, you guys, should declare victory and shut your doors. Because we were in a post-racial America. 2009. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, right? Uh, but back then, the New York Times and Washington Post and you name it, we were all in a post-racial utopia because Barack won the presidency. 
Um, and it was really hard. So part, part of my job then was to oversee development as well as communications. It was an impossible time to think about scaling something that had already been accomplished. Um, I'm not even gonna tell you the story about that, but get to this point, um, which is today. So Tom was sitting next to me at breakfast and he was talking about how people thought he was kind of loony for years when he founded NextGen because young people don't vote. This is an apathetic group. Why are you wasting so much money? My part of that story would be 2016 when I, was, when I observed something that was called, what I, what I actually called, generational gerrymandering. So I've been dealing with racial gerrymandering for a long time. You know, so it's sort of packing and cracking. So packing is when you put all black people into one district so they're gonna get one vote, they're gonna determine the, the, the one election. And cracking is when you just divide them into as many possible districts so you so dilute the vote. They have no impact. And I noticed that was happening very target, target, in a targeted way by the right. The right were laser focused on packing and cracking young people. Even universities, like the largest HBCU, right? They were splitting it into four districts. Louisiana State University into three districts. It, like imagine if Whaley suddenly became a different, was, uh, or York, they became different districts. So and when you switch dorms, you had to re-register. Uh, which is happening in a lot of places. Couldn't get anyone to listen to me. Uh, and this, will, this is just how, we, how I think of this. Um, so, turn to the Yale Network. Couldn't get anyone to, to, to carry a story about generational gerrymandering, about what was happening to young people. Couldn't get a single story in the New York Times or Washington Post or anywhere else, much less uh, in an audience like this. So thank you, Ken, and thank you, Rachel. Um, but, but by the time we got to 2018 when young people showed up, Michael Weinzer, New York Times, or uh, Gabriella Novella, um, or, you know, th these are people who finally got a story. We got the first landscape story. So my, uh, and the society had shifted. We also realized after the rise of Donald Trump and others that we were not in a post-racial America. And we also realized when power shifted in Washington that young people's vote really mattered. Um, but what got us to finally own part of the conversation was literally people like uh, Ken Inanomi, um, who's here, or, or I look at the people who help us. So to take what Marika said, there are certainly in, uh, relations with individual donors, but my seed of individual donors are in this room, especially the, the conversations about, because um, I cannot force, I could not foresee where we'd be today and the urgency of this moment in, in engaging young people and get them to vote. And the total shift to the kind of conversation I made in 2009, which was very legalistic, rights vindication and moral authority, to data-driven work. So my largest grant, uh, which was 2021, was by Salesforce and Tableau, $1 million, to say, can you, can you come up with a data-driven approach to the work you're doing, as opposed to just moral authority and, and this frame that I used to use then, which was, of course, you know, democracy is not a sprint, and can you would like this, I hope. Uh, neither is it a marathon. It is a relay, right? It's a relay. And so you have to pass it on to the next generation. Um, so what I, what I have constantly had to do, and it is, first it was painful, because I think I, I thought I knew it all. And then I realized this process is really important as circumstances change and facts change and people change. There's a generational momentum that changes. There are four million young people that turn 18 every year in America and become eligible to vote. There are 2.5 million uh, older Americans that die every year. So between 2016 and 2024, there'll be a net of 52 million younger people. 32 million of them who were too young to vote for Donald Trump in that election. Um, so in this room, just to close off, uh, to get to scale, I have had conversations for years with Astrid from a totally different perspective. I used to also run New Jersey Head Start, by the way, for all the people who do early childhood education and drawing connections with, 
with people who think about things very differently. My first job from Yale was at Goldman. Who would believe that? <laughs> um, but that has served me very well uh, in seeing people not as an enemy, but as allies. And figuring out how to get them. And you, you talked about the cheer. Uh, um, how to get the allies who are totally different from me but have the same values, but to think of things very differently. So I brought these things, um, which I'd like to share. But first, my allies are artists. So like Nicholas Roman Lewis. Uh, don't do everything he does, but you know he dated for 25 years and just got married. So <laughs> that's not the fiance you want. Um, but congratulations, Nicholas. Uh, a lawyer and an artist and incredibly talented. I cannot make the kind of uh, design that's or setting a mirror. So I love people who went to Fashion Institute of Technology and Parsons Institute of Design or Yale School of Architecture. Um, and they think of what are the things that would get people to uh, align themselves with you. So, you know, we have a lot of people who are depressed in America right now. A lot of people are on Xanax. And the remedy for this, right, is this, Gen Xanax, <laughs> right? Because they are amazing, this generation, if we can empower it. But if you think of things as disease, we have a, you know, we have a lot of disease, COVID, etc. then we need democracillin, <laughs> right? Um, so I want to share this with you, um, because in this Yale community, we have people with such tremendous talent that is diverse talent, not just the, the skin color and sexual orientation and religion, but just talent that could have a complex way of, of resolving a, um, an issue. In terms of data-driven, you know, we have to stretch ourselves. I had to stretch myself. And one of the ways was a million bucks from Salesforce. How do we analyze and, and have data to support the kinds of things that we do? So we came up with a model, which I'm gonna share with you, of where young people could actually exercise the same amount of power. Would you mind passing that for me, please? Um, that, that they actually can show when you have districts like in Iowa that were won by th six votes, or New York that was won by 109, or California by 133, or Lauren, Berber, Lauren Boebert by 456, or John Duarte by 565, that's the marching band, that's the gospel choir, that's the football team. That's your dorm room that can swing that election. <laughs> so um, what I'm trying to say is, going back to you, Ken, last night, you are not alone. I have felt so alone for decades. You come to this room and you come to this talent and you realize you're not alone and you don't have to be the only one saving the world. You just have to be able to figure out how to synthesize all these all the other people's talents that are actually here to do it. And that's how we have changed the conversation, not just Tom, but Thomas certainly deserves a lot of credit for thinking of young people. But we've changed the conversation so that we could grow. But it's not just getting to scale. We've figured out, I think, the smartest way for this particular moment, how to scale our impact, which is to increase our work in particular ways but in a very multi-talented way to get to the solution. Wonderful, well thank you so much, Max, and that's a wonderful overview of uh, how to capture imaginations um, uh, in relationships. And uh, I think every one of our panelists have talked about in different ways when you can capture relationships in a specific relationship or, or, or to try to do it at scale with engaging cultural attitudes in, in, in these fascinating ways backed by, backed by data. Let me ask our panelists to, to respond to a trend before we turn it to the audience for questions. So um, we have some research at the Indiana University uh, Lilly Family School of Philanthropy where I happen to serve as dean and others who have looked at kind of patterns of giving uh, in the United States and we have seen that fewer households are giving. Uh, as recently as 10 years ago, we were able to say that more Americans actually gave than voted. In our polarized times, that's really flipped over and we see fewer households fewer households giving, and, and when you talk to most nonprofits, you will see that most of them say that they get more of their money from a smaller number of high, high net worth individuals. So there's a, there's a fear of dependency there. So let me, let me ask our panelists what, what, what they make of that trend for individual organizations or for the health of our democracy more broadly. Let's, let's start with Anthony. Oh, um, I thought maybe you had a point of view on that. 
I mean, I have a point of view on almost everything, but that doesn't mean I should go first. More informed than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think in part it is, um, I feel like you should answer this question, but I think in part it is a, a part of the associational decline, uh, would be my guess. Um, in other words, you know, the decline in people, whether it's going to church, going to community center, et cetera. I don't know when you saw the, the dip, um, but I would imagine the broader associational decline is, is, is the, one of the main drivers because actually peer pressure is important to giving. Yeah. Um, and we tend to see now more things like a big match, right? So somebody puts in a million dollars. I just got one of these letters from a very small town uh, where I used to live, and they said, you know, we got. $500,000 for the library and we need to raise a match, right? So I'm happy to give on the one hand. On the other hand, it seems insane. Like why does this person who has $500,000 not just give a million dollars and leave the rest of us alone, right? So I think, like, I think there is some of that feeling, right? So you have the combination of associational decline and gross inequality and people's real understanding of gross inequality. And so why do the people who have, an, you know, now I'm representing a foundation, so in that sense, I, though not me as a person, I have a ton of money, right? so I would put myself in that category, but why do the organizations, people, companies, you know, individuals, families, et cetera, why do they not just give all the money? So I think there's a little bit of bitterness about that, and I think the associational decline, and I think there's a sense of um, collective ineffectiveness. Mm -hmm which is reflected both in the democracy conversations and in a conversation like this, where people feel like, what's the point, right? What's the point? The problem is so big, the structure is so big, et cetera, right? So there I can use the small town example I gave as a counter example. So there's a $500,000 asking for a match for this small town library. I know actually that even my $5, $10, $100, right? Match or no match makes a huge difference to that library. Because I know that library, and I know that kid's library, and I know that they, you know, what, they, what they're trying to do. So I think you can see uh, the kind of community, the community um, disintegration dynamics in that data uh, in a different way. No, I, I would agree. I think those are, those are all the kind of hypotheses that scholars look at. And faith, are there any faith-based organizations in the room? So that's a huge part of our, our um, kind of our civic infrastructure and that's where most of the money goes and that's where the most of the decline is we're experiencing and there's a very, very strong correlation between faith membership and giving and so that's one of the issues in addition to just the fact that people don't have resources and then that younger people are also delaying the usual markers of adulthood that are highly correlated with, with giving as well. Anthony Maxim, do you have? I, I just thank you for giving me some time to think about it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, so I'll tell you what it's not. So, the, the, the rise of the, by the way, impact investing, this fundamental idea that you can address the social and environmental issues you care about through for-profit investing, not just through charity. It's not a new idea. We coined the phrase in 2007. That concept is actually goes back in every cultural tradition I've encountered. There's some precedent for this idea that a for-profit investment should be not simply pursuing profit for its, the owner of the capital. Um, so there's one hypothesis out there that the rise of impact investing has led people to believe they no longer need grant-seeking nonprofits. I have not seen any data that affirms the hypothesis that we are the reason for philanthropic decline. But we get that challenge. Those of us in the impact investing industry are told, you guys are actually not only doing no good because it's not morally legitimate or economically effective to solve social problems through investments, it's even worse you're doing net negative because you're making people no longer believe in the legitimacy of nonprofits. I just haven't seen any data. Anecdotally, maybe, I think impact investing, you know, it's not like the counterfactual to make an impact investment is donating unrestricted funding to a, you know, a radical social justice organization. It's probably buying a bigger boat. Um, so anyway, I think that is a hypothesis that I would challenge and I haven't seen any data to refute it. But just reflecting on my own personal experiences with fundraising, uh, I always say fundraising, reveals something really interesting. I'd love to know you guys, especially when we appeal to our own networks personally. You know, we've all raised money institutionally, but as part of that, you also, every Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa, you know, whatever it is, you send a note out. And like, you know, your friends, your family, maybe people you think of in your circle. And I would say the response, and I love your, your, your experience of this, what I've received back has been always reliably disappointment in the people who I thought would be there for me and incredibly humbling support from people who show up, even though I don't think they necessarily should. And so my reflection on, on personal giving is, you know, 
who are those two sets of people? I think in the latter are the people who don't have a sense of entitlement, they have a sense of appreciation, they have a sense of reciprocity. You know, maybe I did something, I, I gave someone an hour of my time and helped them think through an issue they had in the organization. And then when the appeal comes, they send me $100 and put a note saying, I really value what you did for me. There's that sense of, and then on the other side, who are the people who you think should be there for you and don't? It's the people who are entitled. Um, and I wonder if part of the, what's happening in our society is there is a growing sense of entitlement among people with power. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't disagree. I'm, and and uh, I'll, I'll give Max some last word on this topic before we turn it to, to the audience. Um, so I'll tell you a story, briefly. Uh, I met with Tyler Perry about 50, 14 years ago. Um, and he was just, had become famous, but not as wealthy as he is today. Uh, and I was trying to get him to give, and he hadn't been philanthropic at all, uh, for the most part. Uh, I got $1.5 million, which at, the, which at that time was the largest single gift by an athlete or entertainer to a civil rights organization. Uh, we still have a market absence of athletes and entertainer giving to social justice and um, civil rights. But he gave it to me and he said he wanted to inspire other folks like himself. And I did as much publicity, even the New Haven Register had a story on this. Um, you know how many people followed? Zero, to your point. Um, the other thing that, that, that I want to note is, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna what, what you said I'll take as a given about the entitlement. Uh, but the relationship building, um, there are so many people in this room over the last 20 years that have given to anything I've asked them to. Right, like, like Rachel, like Ken, like Cheryl, like Nicholas. They've been on boards and committees and uh, it is like we are a tireless group of recycled people. Um, uh, but but it's, it also says we have a shared value that we want this to work. And we believe in the talent, but also the, um, the moral value of the work that each of us does. And I think that's really important with the shifting tides. So let me tell you the other part of the $1 million data money that I got. I can prove from now till the end. I have published proof of concepts, which uh, I would like you guys to read, right? Because I thought this is clearly the winner. I'm go so I even got into an investment bank to give a speech, which I'd never done for all the years I've done civil rights and social justice. So a proof of concept about how young people made the difference, how our particular interventions on particular campuses, which we call tipping point campuses, tip the scales for progressive candidates. I'm a 501c3, so pro-democracy candidates. Um, and I thought the, the money is gonna flow, right? Because we all believe we are in jeopardy. We all see how young people have outperformed in 2018. We saw 2020. We saw last year the end of the red tsunami threat. And I have proof of concept. And what Amir was referencing a little while ago was we've had an over 40% drop in progressive philanthropy this year. We've had almost a 50% drop in political progressive philanthropy. Why? It's insane to me. It's insane. However, I still get money from Rachel, and I still get money from Ken, and Cheryl, and Astrid, and Allison, and so forth, and Mariko. Um, uh, I, I think that I don't know the answer, but I think it, it, is, it is something that we have to figure out. If we've lost the, and since, I, since the NAACP is so connected to the black church, if we've lost that religious faith giving, then we have to figure out how do we create a substitute. And I think we're doing that right here. And for the, you know, I graduated Yale undergrad. God, God. Um, if I started in 1985, that's almost 40 years ago, right? That's a shocking, right? Uh, but in that 40 years, we have, it didn't look like this color, it didn't look like this women, it didn't look at all of the things. And I think that it tells me that we can come up with a frame that doesn't allow what is jeopardizing true success, which is about holding on to our democracy and willing to relay the race with all these 
wonderful young people who are here. Uh, but we have to do it, and we have to figure it out. And if Yaleys can't figure this out, who the hell can? <laughs> well, you, <laughs> you, you see the, the wonderful experience and expertise we have on the panel. So let's turn to you and uh, please uh, engage and ask your questions. Who would like to go first? Um, before I ask my question, is there anybody who is sort of uh, pre-success and a new young prophet? Because my question is on scaling up to the threshold. I'm sorry, can you just uh, mention your name and your, your My name is Esther Zerbel and I have an offer profit right. on post-secondary education. And the question is, if, are you guys interested in this? Sure. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so we have funders or potential funders who say we're going to fund you if you want to, for stipends for students to get a college education. We're designing an extensive program, internships and everything in it. So there is lots of administrative programming stuff. Nobody wants to fund the overhead, but they do want to fund the students. How do you get to the rest of the Happy to, happy to. So uh, I, I wrote a book on this um, with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Uh, two things. You have to meet the market where it is. So there are going to be donors who simply you're, are going to be immovable on this point. Um, but there's no chance you're going to do this unless you own your financial story. And what you have to do, you have to, wherever you can, move the conversation away from outputs to outcomes. So you've got to get them away from, I need this much money to fund this many stipends, to well, these are the outcomes we care about. It's this many people graduating from college, and we have data that says, with this graduation rate, so these are the long-term chances we have of moving families out of intergenerational poverty, whatever those metrics are on the outcomes basis, if you can shift the conversation away from outputs, because when it's an outputs conversation, then the donor is saying, well, you're going to do 100 scholarships for a million dollars, and this person over here is going to do 110 scholarships for a million dollars because they don't have your overhead. If you've got to get the conversation away from the output to the outcome, and you have to convince them that we are the organization that is most effectively going to turn your million dollars into long-term transformation out of generational poverty. Now, there's no guarantee that's going to work, but I can guarantee that if you do not do that, you won't be able to get out of that conversation. And so I'd say that's one thing. It's just own your own financial story and connecting the work you do to outcomes versus outputs. Um, the other thing I'd encourage you to do is be very clear in your own mind about what I'd call the net grant. So when someone says, we're going to give you $100,000, but you know that in order to do the work, and they're only gonna play for stipends, but you know that in order to do that work, you're gonna incur costs of reporting and legal costs and all that. Have your own accounting so you know how much it's actually costing you to get that grant. And some grants are worth walking away from. <laughs> because it could be that the grant they're offering you comes with enough restrictions that when you do the calculation, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, some of these small donors will say, you know, our family, my third generation family foundation wants to give you $20,000 and we're going to come visit you three times and we want reports every six months. You have, part of owning your financial story is knowing what the net grant is. Some of them are worth walking away from. And the last thing I'll say is push back. Um, when someone says, hey, I'm only going to give you the money if you follow the following restrictions, tell them why that doesn't make sense and be willing to walk away. And even when they send you the grant letter, we got a grant letter from one of the richest people in America. His net worth doubled during the pandemic um, from 50 to $100 billion. Uh, he sent us a nice, very generous grant. I was running an organization called the Nonprofit Finance Fund. The grant was literally to help grantees in an area he cared about improve their financial understanding and how they negotiated with funders. We got the grant from a donor advised fund at a very large bank that he had worked through. Um, and when we got the grant, we then rewrote the grant terms. We're like, okay, well, these restrictions don't make sense for us. These reporting requirements don't make sense for us. These IP provisions, and we sent it back to them. Uh, it turned out I got a call from the lawyer at Patterson Belknap who runs their exempt org practice, amazing guy. He said, I need you to give me an exemption because he was our pro bono counsel because this major bank had retained him to negotiate against us. And they said in the history of running their donor advised fund, which at this point has probably given $10 billion out, no one had ever redlined a grant agreement. 
<laughs> so my point is like, and I'm, I'm this live conversation. Right now I've been offered a grant by a, a big, large bank foundation. We redlined the grant agreement. I, this morning we sent it to them. I suspect by now they've sent some emails saying this has never happened before. We'll, I mean, confidentially in this room, we'll take the grant, but at least we're gonna try. So I do think you, know, you project a sense of self-worth when you understand your financial story and push back against some of these evil assumptions. And sometimes they'll say, oh, we had no idea. Because again, the, I guess where I, as we talked about earlier, finding aligned values, I would approach any donor with the assumption that what they are trying to do is turn their generosity into results. And what you're trying to do is to turn their generosity and your hard work into results. And the starting point of the conversation is, I believe that these practices that you have been told as a donor are best practices, like reducing overhead and focusing just on the stipends, is actually going to undermine the thing you care about, which is turning your generosity into results. So let's work together on something we both want to have happen, which is to turn your generosity into outcomes. You have to start from that mentality and then not be naive, because sometimes they're going to say you're being crazy and just take the money. Don't take the money where it's net negative, but at least push back. That would be my advice. Yeah, I think that's great advice. The only thing I would add is a, just corollary to that is demystify the admin for them and not just for yourself, especially if you're a small organization. Right? They may just not understand why it costs what it costs. And admin is a black box, right? Overhead is a black box. They don't know they don't know what's in there, right? So if you can describe to them what's in there, they might even get excited about it. They might even get excited about you trying to build a structure or an infrastructure so that you can actually scale your impact, right? But if you hide it, it's gonna create a weirdness in the relationship even if you're able to build that relationship. I think we could have a whole uh, panel on overhead myth, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there, there's there, there's also one, <laughs> there, whatever you think of Dan Pilate, he has a very popular TEDx talk and a new movie called Uncharitable where he really talks a lot about this with some celebrities to back him up. So if you have the right donor, you might show them the movie. So, Liana. Um, Liana Epstein, class of 2014. Um, so I work in major gift fundraising and a lot of our older donors are aging out. And we are left with the puzzle of a very mobilized, invested, social justice, you know, um, younger generation that has capacity and has wealth. But um, for a lot of reasons, they seem to be hanging on to it more because the world is burning <laughs> and um, they're concerned about their futures. And I don't think they have a lot of trust in organizations to have outcomes quickly. So I was wondering, A, if you could speak a little bit to the trends you're seeing in giving amongst the younger generation and any cultivation tactics or strategies that you have um, for um, an audience that is more online and isn't giving in traditional ways and how people can be creative in figuring out really how to build relationships with the next generation. Let me try that one. Uh, so, the, obviously, you can segment a whole set of younger people into, they're not monolithic. But if we're talking about wealthy young people, or we're talking about masses of young people, not particularly wealthy, young people of color, um, one thing that I do find that is ubiquitous amongst all of them is that they want, they're all creators. Or, you know, we changed the name of our organization, which used to be called SEEP, not a great acronym. Uh, <laughs> It meant Campus Election Engagement Project to civic influencers. Guess why? They all want to be influencers, right? They want to be influencers. And we, well, yeah, absolutely, you should, uh, but for civic life, right, and, and engagement. Um, it is such a different, I remember, if you're older than some of you, um, when I saw uh, the social network, and I thought, God, when I was at Yale, I found it, I found the Observer, uh, we did all this. I never thought of owning it. I didn't have anyone said, trademark it, copyright it. When you wrote a paper, hold on to it. Like, we gave that all away, right? <laughs> that does not happen today. Mm -hmm. Even with my staff, even with my interns. They want to be paid, and they want to get credit, and they want to co-create, right? Um, so I have a couple young people who are under 30 on my board who are both worth Millions. The scale of the millions, I'm not quite sure. 
Uh, one was a Peter Thiel scholar, so that gives you a sense, and has the best performing app on Apple. Um, but co-creation, um, or I have another way of putting it, reverse mentoring. I'm so glad he's mentoring me. <laughs> right? As opposed to me pretending to mentor him. Mm. Right? And I think we have to figure out how to, if we really talk about shifting power and empowering, which is wrong, equipping, which is also wrong, uh, this next generation, we have to learn how to, help, how to have them empower us, equip us, so that we can do this. And I found by shifting that, which is not easy, since we think we've attained a certain status. Um, uh, 2012, when I started teaching at Yale, was a real wake-up call that I knew nothing compared to those students back then. Um, but that is a way that I approach, and I found it is, it is, I've seen a measurable effect of them giving and also participating, but it's also co-owning and co-creating. I'll just add one thing to that, which is just a plus one to teaching. Uh, you asked me before, one of you asked me before about whether I miss being a college president, miss being President Bennington. The main thing I miss is actually having hundreds of people regularly tell me, I don't know shit about shit. Like, I don't know what yes. I'm talking about. Yeah. I don't know anything about the world, whatever. Right? Um, one just very specific thought, because you mentioned donors aging out who are committed. Uh, I do think uh, Maxim's point about the relay, there is something to leverage there, right? So one place, notwithstanding what I said about challenges before, there is, uh, if for example, an, a donor who is aging out, that's a nice way to put it, who's aging out, <laughs> um, wants to make a public estate commitment, right? When I die, I'm gonna leave this amount of money, and that is a challenge to the next generation, right? We built this, you build the next thing. And you, next generation, to your point, can essentially be in control of this money, right? I am, I am deeding it to you, I'm willing it to you in order to build the next thing. There, I think that can be a very effective challenge. There are alumni associations that do that and so forth. May I just add one thing to that? Mm. Plus one to that. Um, so I give, I give different versions of what I said. And years ago, I got invited, because Gamal, I forgot Gamal, Gamal Palmer, so not Yeli, who ran the Jewish Federation in LA. And I suddenly got invited to the circuit of Jewish federations around the country, which is all about the intergenerational giving. It was amazing. And I'm planning to do, to do that again. Uh, because of the California Foundation, um, Community Foundation has asked me to also sort of recreate that more, now 10 years later. Uh, because it's an important, it actually is an important role that we have to play. How do you keep this relay going? Including the transfer of wealth, which is gonna be massive yeah. right now. Um, and what are the, I don't, know, I don't know the secret sauce, but we certainly know there are certain things that we can do that can help, including this conversation and this challenge, which I haven't thought about, but I'll steal it. Um, you can have it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, we have time for one more question. There's a gentleman right here. Hi, my name is Tian Lu Xue. I just got my uh, master degree from Yale last year. And uh, earlier this year, some friends and I co-founded a Chinese-English uh, bilingual theater company called My Theater in New York City earlier this year. And um, one is that we are somehow new growing in this industry, too, as some of you who work in the theater industry, you know that it's essentially no profit or hard to profit from these projects or productions. So my question for you is that, uh, but it has very high impact. So my question for you is that how, one, what kind of donors or, or funds should we reach out to to get fundraising? Two, how do we convince them for this high impact but lower, like no profit programs or projects, how do we convince them this should be a good program to invest in? Thank you. So I'll just say, you know, just some of you may have followed the announcement of the um, Donor Coalition Press Forward in support of local journalism. Um, one of the things that I really like that John Palfrey, who's the president of the MacArthur Foundation, said when he launched it, somebody said, you know, when is it gonna become independently sustainable and not need philanthropic support anymore? And he said, never, right. never. The same is true for theater. The answer is never. Um, and I think the, I, the idea of just framing out version of what you just said, which is this has value. This has value to community, actually has value to multiple communities, making the case for that value, that impact, um, and going from there, rather than getting sucked into the whirlpool of conversation about when are you gonna be self-sustaining? When, 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 when are ticket sales actually gonna pay everybody's salary and health insurance and pension? That would be never, right? So I think 
to just not actually waste your time and energy there. In terms of what kind of donors, think about all of the intersecting interests and actually try to get them in conversation through you with one another. Right? We have support from the Chinese American community because, right? We, and we have support from the theater community because. And donors are often encouraged by knowing that there are other donors of allied interest from a different angle. It's another way of thinking about the diversification of revenue. These are not diff diverse revenue types necessarily, um, but it's revenue motivations. Uh, and, and sort of mapping that out for yourself. Who are all the different kinds of constituencies? And then going for both a combination of individual donors um, and institutional donors who would support that. And I would say institutional donors are very influenced by the participation of individual donors, and individual donors are very influenced by the participation of institutional donors. So just tell those stories back and forth and across. I made it sound very easy. I know it's not. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful advice, and uh, hopefully you might get a chance to come up after the panel and ask any burning last-minute questions. But please join me in thanking our amazing panel for a wonderful experience.